and sell bread before going to school. So that is how my family was brought up. My mother was a very hard-working woman, and uh, I used to enjoy her a banquet. <laughs> With a puffing. Yes, a puffing. <laughs> Now, so um, at what age did you begin elementary school? That's an interesting story. My father had the belief that all his children should be taught at home before they are sent to school. So by the time you get to school going age, he will be teaching you A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, oh. 1, 2, 3, up to 100, or, and then the times multiplication. It, but when he got to my turn, he didn't have time. He had too much work to do. So I didn't go to elementary school till I was about 10 years old. And by the time he, he took me to school, he taught me so well that I didn't have to stay in class one. So I was in class one for one day. <laughs> they did a, an examination, and I was top of the class. So I went to class two for one week. Then I went to class three for about the first term. Then I went to standard one. So I caught up in years wow. from when I started, and that was the trick of my father. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. So after elementary school, you went to Fijai. I went to Fijai Secondary Fijai School. Secondary. And Which we'll year? I, I'm, I'm happy and proud to say that we were the second batch of the uh, Fijai Secondary School. It was then secondary school. Mm -hmm. But then when we moved to our own premises on top of the hill, and the place is called Fijai, we named it second. Fijai Secondary School, and the first headmaster came from Fantepim Secondary School, Mr. Charles Kwe, who was a very strict headmaster mm -hmm. and uh, very disciplined, and you couldn't get away with any tomfoolery. And uh, what kind of student were you, the, the bookworm or the, you know? I wasn't, I wasn't the one quiet of, type. I wasn't the quiet type, I was a bit rascally. Really? Yes, <laughs> but I always stayed on course. And uh, I wasn't, I wouldn't say that I was the best in class. I was just an average student. But I was, I had always shown interest in entertainment. So when I got out of school, my father, the first thing he did was to take me to his bank, back to his bank, and ask the manager to, if he could consider employing me. And because of his standard and his relationship with the bank, I was considered an employed at back to his bank, High Street, back of that's where I was for three years. Was it? Yeah, three years. Then I was transferred to Tamale, and from there I became a broadcaster. So, so I'm jumping the gun for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So um, why did you consider a job in broadcasting? Because being a banker to me would, would have been a, a better option. That was my father's money. wish, that he wanted me to do banking. And uh, I think I was doing pretty good as a banker, too. But my interest in show business was a little more interesting to me than being a banker. And the bank, the, the broadcasting thing also came by accident. Okay. What I did was, uh, because of my interest in broadcasting, I listened to a lot of radio, both BBC and the local Read Efficient Boxes. And uh, GBC has started a program called Guitar Club, where a group of guitarists, two or three guitarists, would get together and play jazz music. There was one in Accra, led by Mr. Rathquist. He's still alive and well. And then there was another one in Kumasi. So they had Kumasi Guitar Club and Accra Guitar Club. But I thought that Sekindi Chakot had the two best guitarists in the country then, because okay. I've been following the music scene. So I got them together to rehearse until I thought they, was re they were ready to go on the air. Then I wrote to Mr. Leo Rabbi Williams, who was then the head of entertainment and broadcasting. I'm talking about 19, 1961, thereabout. And then he came to Takarati to record Radio Dance Time. And to listen to, I wanted him to come and audition my group. Mm -hmm. But when he heard them, he thought they were ready to be recorded. So he recorded this right away and broadcast it on the national network. And it became a very successful broadcast. So, and interestingly, I always remember this part of the story. I used my time and my money to hire the instruments and pay their transportation and, and entertain refreshment to come and rehearse for about a month and a half. But when the recording was done, they were each paid 
five guineas, five pounds, five shillings. We were using pounds and pounds the sterling time. then. So they were given five pounds, five shillings. And me, the sponsor and the, the producer, <laughs> the, the producer and, the, and the, what's the name for it? The entrepreneur. I wasn't given a penny. <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't worry me. The fact that I have successfully done a recording put them put and put them together for, for them to record and broadcast, I was happy. But Leo Rabbi Williams took notice of me and my interest in entertainment. So one day, he came to Takaraji to do radio dance time. And fortunately for me, and unfortunately for him, the regular MC was out of town. So he asked if I could MC the program. The program. And I happily jumped for the opportunity, <laughs> even though I wasn't sure I could do it. But I accepted the invitation, and we were living close to the beach, so I went to the beach to rehearse. What I found out was that the program was popular because the MCs or the presenters were able to paint a picture of what's going on on the floor to the listener, that they have a, a picture in their mind's eye what the show is like. So I also rehearsed at the beach as to what I would... Do I you remember what you, you rehearsed at the time? I, I don't remember precisely, but something to the effect that, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is Radio Dance that I'm coming to you from Zenith Hall in Takarati. My name is Mike Egan, and I'm happy to have two bands on the stage for you to play, play the music that you like and love to dance to. Something to that effect. Yeah. And I think it impressed Mr. Lee Rabbi Williams. So when he came to Accra and did the broadcast, the following Monday, I had a call from him saying that, would you like to change jobs? Wow, just like that. Just like that. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> With immediate effect. With immediate effect. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem was, how do I tell my father that okay. I'm leaving the banking institution that he wants me to, to follow? To broadcasting. So I had an agreement with my mother, bless his soul, <laughs> that he should help me find a store to tell the old man. And go. And go. So I left Takradi straight to Accra, the broadcasting house, and joined broadcasting. So that's the little story with my ent entertainment life and why and how I got into broadcasting. So on which particular day did you finally um, uh, 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 went to GBC or begin your Well, new another uh, interesting part of this story is that when my father eventually found out that I was in broadcasting, he sent my late uncle, Mr. Mawson, from Takrada with a car to come and pick me and hold me by the hand and take me back. <laughs> so he did that, and of yeah. course, my father wants me back. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say no. So I went back to Takrada, and the next morning, he made me get myself together, and then he took me in his car to Barclays Bank, High Street, Takrada. Took me to the manager, Mr. Every was his name. Apologized profusely to him that I've been naughty, da 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 da, and if you could kindly consider taking me back. The manager listened and said, I've been watching your son in, <laughs> in, in the office. He's more an entertainment person than banking. But I, I'll give you a chance, opportunity. Let him go and do the broadcasting. If within six months he's not making headway, he can come back, mm -hmm. I'll re employ him. Wow. And my father was saying, pure civil servant, so civil and so obedient that he, doesn't, he can't say no to a white man. <laughs> so when Mr. Avery said that he was going to make me that offer, he readily and safely accepted it. And I was allowed to come back to Accra to continue with my broadcasting life. So at GBC, you worked as a presenter. I worked Which as a Which shows did you um, host? Well, we hosted, I, ho I hosted jazz music on radio. And that was when Ghanaian soldiers were in the Congo helping the freedom fighters. We were broadcasting music request programs for, for them. They would request records for their relatives and wives that they had left here. Their wives would request a record to be played for their husbands in the Congo. So I was presenting that. We were also presenting a lot of live band music, uh, band, bandstand and radio dance time, and jazz music, high life music. And we were also compiling music programs for the external service. And this, I was employed in broadcast in 1961, April, to be precise.
So before you went on air, what kind of preparation did you put in to ensure that you, know, you went on air and then came out successfully? I must say that David and I, David and I were employed about the same time. Maybe there's a week, a week. He was there before I did, but maybe there was only one week between us. And we worked together as, as a team. But the person who helped us most was Peter Myers. He was uh, from Mauritius. But he came here to Ghana with his parents. And then he wasn't a trained broadcaster, but he was so talented that he could, he could do wonderful things with, in, in the studio. So he sort of took us to the tutelage of broadcasting. But luckily also, GBC had a training school. So we were attached to the training school for a couple of months. And we went through the rudiments of broadcasting, how to speak with the right inflection, enunciation, and pronunciation. We were, we were taking through all those courses. And we were presenting such programs. I mean, going through your, your, your biology, autobiography and other stuff, um, I realized that th there was a point that you left GBC for BBC. So how did you get that link to well, work with BBC? I left GBC not to go to BBC straight mm -hmm. away. I left GBC because at the time that I left, my good friend and partner, but David and I were known as the Siamese twins. We did everything together. If David went to a shop and found a shirt that he thought it was nice, he would buy two. Mm -hmm. Give me one and you keep one, and I would do the same thing. But we were so close together that even our scooters had the same colors. And if you saw David in the corner, you can be sure that Mikey Gunn is he following followed. and vice versa. So David had a good offer from the Ghana film industry to become one of the executive officers there. So he left and left me alone. So I went to my boss, Mr. F uh, George Akrofi, who was then head of, Leo had left for the television department then. So I went to him and said, look, my partner and good friend has left. He's being given X amount as his salary. And uh, can you do something about my salary so that I would stay? Mm. And he said, I should go and do music up to grade five. <laughs> then he could consider me for increment. And was that feasible at the time? It was feasible, but where is the time for me to go and study? How long am I going to take that course? Two, three years. Meanwhile, David was ahead of me, and we were apart. So just at that same time, a friend of mine, whose, whose brother was then the deputy head of Volta River Authority, Mr. Futa, Bashir Futa, he, he, my, his brother was a good friend of mine. So he said to me, would you like to work in Volta River Authority? They, they need an entertainment manager. Oh, okay. And you are in entertainment. Would you like to do it, take a job like this? And I readily accepted it. And I was given a letter of appointment. My salary was a little bit more than broadcasting house. But they had some beautiful pecs. Mm -hmm. I had my own bungalow okay. with a car and two drivers ah. to run the place. So I went back to Mr. Akrofi and said, look, this is uh, my offer in black and white. What can you do? Because I love broadcasting. I don't want to leave broadcasting. He said, do the, go and study the music or <laughs> forget <come> it. Back. <laughs> so, I, so with that sort of yeah. block wall, I decided to take the appointment. So I went, I left GBC. For VRA. For VRA. And I was there for one year from 65 to 66. Then I left. BBC. Whilst I was there, I was saving and planning how I can go to BBC. Because it was then the tradition that GBC staff are usually sent to BBC for training and then they come back. But because I haven't reached that st stage, Level. I had to do it on my own. So I, I saved my own money and found my way to BBC. The other condition, the other incentive was that they've, they've Peter Myers, that I said, trained David and I. I left for BBC and was having his own series on GBC. BBC called Good Morning Africa. So I thought that if he is there and I went over, he will help me to get myself established. So with that, I saved some money and went. And it's interesting to know that when I was leaving Ghana for BBC in 1966, 
the return ticket was 300 CDs, which with a bit of savings I could easily afford. So I went to BBC, got my ticket, 300 CDs, <laughs> went to London, and went and found Peter Myers, who took me to the studio, introduced me to a few, few of the producers, and then did an interview with me as to my aim and my vision and what I was doing in Ghana. But that was the best he could do for me then. So every morning, I would go to BBC, <laughs> sit down and read the newspapers, hoping that something would happen. Luckily, one day, the head of African Center, Mr. Bill Ev Everyham, Every yeah, Everyham, saw me, came to where I was sitting and reading, that young man, I've seen you sitting down here for days. Who are you and what do you want? And that was a golden opportunity for me to pour my heart out to <laughs> him. So I told him, I gave him a background of who I am yeah. and what I intend doing and why I'm there. And he said, okay, we'll see what we can do. The following day, he came with another producer called Mr. Tony Cox, that he was interested in African music and he wanted to introduce African music on the, on the world service. So Tony talked to me and asked whether I could do a pilot program to be broadcast. We agreed on the name of the program, Music with an African Beat, so that it can cover a wider range of okay. genres. Yeah. And we did the pilot, it was listened to, and it was accepted. And from 1966 to 1970, I did the broadcast every day, ev every week, twice broadcast. Mm. One is live, one is re re uh, what you call playback mm. for four years. And it's interesting to know that I came back from the from UK on a Black Star Line ship, Sakumon Lagoon. <laughs> the, the, the day that I arrived in Ghana, that was the day that they played the last tape that I recorded. Mm. And I was, I was traveling for four weeks on the sea, on the high seas. Mm. So for four, four weeks, my, I recorded enough programs to be broadcast till mm. I got to Ghana. And I had the last broadcast of my own self in Ghana. Uh, Mr. McKeegan, let's take a quick break and when we come back, we'll talk more. The program is Legend of Our Time of BBC News and Ghana Television. My name is Gifty Ije and my guest for today is Mr. Mike Egan, the A broadcaster. I'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more. Please stay. <laughs> Again, is still watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. On Legends of Our Time, we speak to people who are impacting our society positively. My name is Gifty AJ, and my guest for today is Mr. Mike Egan, huge media personality. Huge. Still I on it. <laughs> I don't of often hear my name being called Mr. Mike Egan. I only hear Mike Egan. <laughs> I'm comfortable calling you, Mr. Mike Egan. Okay, if that makes yeah. you feel good. Yeah. And I'm humbled. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Egan, from BBC, you came back to GBC before you came up with your own show, the Mike Egan Show. Yes. Was it the case? Yes, the story with my return was that I had been there four years working with BBC, and I had done a lot of interviews with different people. I interviewed a lot of foreign artists and the uh, Ghanaians who visited the, the UK. Okay. Now I thought it was time for me to come back 
and share my experience with the Ghanaian populace. But what motivated me even the more, what was a catalyst was that my son, my elder son, who you met a little while ago, was then about seven years old. And what I used to do in London was that every Sunday, I take the whole family laundry to the laundrette, wash them, come back home, and be ironing it, ironing them. Whilst I'm ironing, I'll be watching football. And then my son comes down to change the channel <laughs> whilst I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching my, 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 my football. And I asked him to not to change it. I changed, and he changed it again. <laughs> so I smacked him. The following Monday, it was a Sunday, Monday, I get back from work, and I, my doorbell rings. I open, there's a lady that I didn't know from Adam said that he wanted, she wanted to speak with me. He, she asked if I was Mike Egan. I said, yes. Can I come and speak with you? I said, yes. She came in and said that his son, my son was in school, and for the whole day, he wasn't himself. And they had a chat with him and realized that I have smacked him, mm -hmm. that I shouldn't smack him again. I should, I should appeal to his conscience and talk to him and advise him not to do whatever mm -hmm. he did wrong. And that was alien to me. To your culture. So I said to myself, I can't bring my children up here in a society that has this attitude. And how many notes that I had taken from my parents for doing <laughs> the wrong thing? And I can't do that. To so I, I was thinking, when can I come back early enough so that my son does not grow into that, that culture? And luckily, Mr. Ajilolo, who was then the deputy director of broadcasting, was in the UK recruiting staff for various positions in broadcasting and came to, and I was also having a stint at the recruitment center of Ghana Embassy, 38 Queen's Gate. I remember the address. So I applied to him that I would like to come back to Ghana and he readily, in fact he was looking for me too, so he readily offered me an appointment to come back to Ghana and my passage was going to be paid for me, and I chose to come by boat. So ev everything was done. I got my appointment letter, and I boarded the, the boat from Tilbury to Ghana. And it was the, one of the most beautiful, most fascinating trips that I've ever had in my life. I was on the high seas for one month. Mm. You wake up in the morning, and for, you can go one whole week without seeing land, <laughs> just pure water. Okay nice and blue color. And the captivating side for me was at some stages in the night, you see dolphins jumping and diving. <laughs> and the sky and the sea mesh so beautifully that it's, it's so moving mm -hmm. that I love that. And I've been dreaming whether I can afford to go on a similar trip again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on it. <laughs> so you finally came home? I finally came back joined to Ghana. GBC. G joined GBC. Okay. And uh, I think I introduced a few innovative things in, in broadcasting. I think I was the first to introduce a way of disc jockeying where you talk over the record just before a beat comes on or just before the vocal begins. I did that and also introduced the, the phone in segment. Phone in seg segment. And I take a pride. And if Modesto would permit me to say that, I was the first to introduce phone in, in Ghana in 1971. Okay. I don't know whether you were born <laughs> then. <laughs> I was. <laughs> was it that challenging at the time? It was challenging because the then head of technical department, Mr. Sam, was not prepared to help me do that. What was the reason? It's, it's too dangerous. And, and he wasn't sure who would be phoning in. But luckily, there was a technician on duty who appreciated what I was talking about. So he said, we can do it. So he was the first to connect me, I did it, and it worked. And I started a series called Buzz Me, B-U-Z-Z. -Z. So call me, and we'll talk. And my co-hostess was Dr. Joyce Ayi. Okay. So the two of us hosted the program. And what we did was every week, we would choose a subject maybe fashion, a woman wearing wigs. Then we, we allow people to phone in and express their opinions and various views on that. 
But one day, Joyce and I agreed to discuss f press freedom. This was a champion's regime, military regime. And the head of the department was so scared that press freedom was too, too sensitive to That's be discussed. Okay. Yeah. So you, we shouldn't discuss it. So I said, we have run the program for a year and a half without having any difficulty or any complaints from the authorities. That, that the, the authorities. So if you allow us to do it, and I know we can steer it so well that there won't be any problem. He insisted that, no, don't try it. So my condition was that either I do the program or the program ends. Okay. So the program ended abruptly without a sign off. And they got Ashikote, who was also one of the senior broadcasters, to continue. But the reception, the audience reception was poor, mm -hmm. so the program was taken off the air. So yeah. that's one of the programs and the, the, the birth of phone-ins. Today, phone-in is so common. Mm -hmm. Everybody does phone-in mm -hmm. in various languages. That's, that's good. Now, in, in 1971, <coughs> you hosted the Soul to Soul concert at the Blaster Square. Uh, where we had uh, a lot of prominent African-American artists featuring. Uh, share that experience with us. What really happened during that uh, uh, Well, concert? there was, a, was this American in town who wanted to, to put up a show like this. I've forgotten his name. But he originally wanted to do a film of some African touch in Nigeria. But because of the civil war in Nigeria, he decided to come to Ghana mm -hmm. and do it. So when he came to Ghana, he came, and his son brought this idea of bringing Afri African American artists to Ghana to come and team up with local artists and do the show. So when they came to Ghana, they went to the art center, which was the cultural center of, of, of entertainment in Ghana, to talk to them. And somebody mentioned that they should come to GBC and contact me because I am in touch with the musicians. That's how we linked up. We, they contacted me and we discussed it. I knew, I got an idea what they wanted and they also offered me to do all the jingles for the show and also asked me to be the MC for the occasion. And I would like to say that that's one of the highlights of my career. Here there was this troupe of American artists, Wilson Pickett, Santana, Voices of East Harlem, uh, Roberta Flack, Eddie Harris, and then the local artists were Shalot Dada, uh, who was, was there, Guy Warren or Ghana back then, the Damas Choir. They used to be very popular in, on, on radio and television mm -hmm. here in Ghana. So all these people were brought together, and it was a marathon night. It started from 6 p.m. to 6 o'clock in the morning. Now was the MC for the entire show. Mm -hmm. and if you listen to the record, you will hear my voice on it. And I think that's, that's a good highlight for me in my <laughs> career. Yeah, of course it is. So you <coughs> finally um, began your own program, the Mike Egan Show. Yes, mm. yes. Show with that. The Mike Egan Show also has, has a story to go by. Okay, so the Mike Egan Show. The Mike Egan Show. Mm. I was, I've been watching TV in Ghana, mm. and I thought that, there could be a segment where the host can talk to two, three different people at a time, a chat show with a bit of music in, in, in the middle. And I went in to discuss the matter with the head of programs television, Mr. Van der Poel. He said, bring me a, a paper on, on the subject. So I went and gave him a memorandum. And that was the end of it. But the birth of the Martigan show goes like this, that there was a program on TV called In Town, where people who have traveled or events in town, the personalities involved are interviewed on TV. Unfortunately, the program had run for a few years and was losing its popularity. So they wanted a replacement. And even though Mr. Van der had rejected my, my first paper, he called me and asked me to re-represent. Re so I did. And the program was, was asked, Mr. Cognitilla was asked to produce it. And they wanted a pilot. So Cobna and I sat down and planned the program. And it was recorded. 
Commissioner then called me about a month later and said that the program was going to be viewed, reviewed uh, at a certain time in a certain studio, and he would like me to be there, but I shouldn't be seen. Mm -hmm. So at the appropriate time, when the lights were off, I sneaked in into the, into the studio and watched the, pro the, uh, the Mike Egan show being screened. The, the, the philosophy behind the program was that I thought that everybody has uh, something to say, depending on the way he's, he's interviewed. The taxi driver has a story to tell that is unique. The executive officer in the company has a story to tell that is also unique. Mm -hmm. And the ordinary pedestrian sees things differently from what, what, what I see. And he, all, all these stories can be put together nicely and packaged. That was the philosophy behind the program. When the pilot program was viewed by the panel, someone said, the program is good, but Mike Egan is difficult. <laughs> How? Because I, I was, my discipline and my upbringing is different, a little different from other people. So people see me as a very difficult person, person to, 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 to maybe you. a better word is tough. That's, that's, that's what you said, <laughs> tough person. Yeah. So when the, the comment was made, I gave her a wry cup. <laughs> 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 and everybody turned and saw me there. Mm -hmm. So the program was accepted. I don't think my cuff was, was what made the master of it, but they thought that uh, it was a good program to replace in town. So that's how the, the program started. And I was lucky to have interviewed quite a number of people. Bishop Sapon was one of my guests. Uh, I, ca I can't remember all of them now. Yeah. Super Odi was one of my guests. The interesting thing about Super Odi is that everybody knows that his, his language, his English language is not yeah. that strong. But he said, if he came on my program, he will insist that I should interview him in English. <laughs> so he, Why? Wa he wanted to prove to me that he speaks <laughs> English better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so he came, and he mm -hmm. did pretty well, but it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. It was so, so interesting that mm -hmm. he managed to mix English and tree together on the program. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed Mary Makeba. Okay. I, interview I interviewed quite a number of people. The only people that I didn't get the chance to interview were, were heads of state. And what stopped you from getting them? Because they were not prepared to come on the show. You know, I had worked in broadcasting from 1961 to 65 and came back in 1970. And I, I, I can say that I've seen all the different heads of state. I've stepped under them. And I, I've, I've witnessed all the coups. And I've seen the changes. And people are scared to come on air to speak. Again, press freedom was very limited. So that's maybe the reason why I never got the chance to interview. But I, I, as far as the musicians and entertainment personalities are concerned, I interviewed quite a number of them, too many to, to list today. So uh, beyond the media work, uh, you are now into politics. I got into politics again by sheer accident. I was there one day. But I've, I've always been interested in politics, but not actively involved. And I do remember when I was in Standard 5, Kwame Nkrumah had started his campaign, his freedom fight, his independence struggle, and has introduced SG now. You know, the, the, his opposition members were talking about SG step by step. And he was talking about SG self-government now. And he's done stickers. And I put a sticker on my shirt. I didn't understand the import of the, the statement he's making. But I did that out of sheer, I don't know whether to slight or out of re re rebellion. <laughs> and then it was Empire Day. I don't know if you know the story of Empire Day. Please do tell us. Empire Day was a day that students in the primary schools would all march to go and salute the district commissioner, a white man, mm. at one particular place. People in Second Eve would go to Escado Park. People in Cape Coast would go to Victoria Park and march 
and salute. It was it was inaugurated in uh, in honor of Queen Queen Victoria, mm. but as part of the Empire Day celebrations, all students will have to march and salute go and salute the the district, district commissioner. So on this particular day, out of my foolishness, let's <laughs> put it that way, and the uh, rebellious attitude, I, I, I stuck a badge on my, on my breast pocket, mm. and it was noticed by my school headmaster. So on the Monday, I was called to the parade, and there's four big boys. <laughs> that means we're going to whip you. Mm. So they stretch you out, mm. four big boys, two in front holding two your hand, two at the back. And then they, they're giving you, depending on the gravity of your offense, <laughs> if it's a serious offense, maybe 12 lashes. Mm. If it's a minor mm. offense, six lashes or three. Well, but usually it begins with six. Mm. So I was given six lashes for carrying the badge on my breast. So that's as far as my politics went in those days. But when I grew up and I was working, one day a good friend of mine and my business partner called me and said, Mike, are you busy? Mm -hmm. I was running Sun Sunrise Hotel then. He said, I'm not too busy. He said, wait for me, I'm coming. So he came and said, come with me. We're going to meet a friend. We went to meet Mr. Tommy Thompson, who was then the editor of Free Press. And he was uh, a staunch in Chromites and a staunch CPP person. And he has set up a group called the Heritage Club. And this was the beginning of the introduction of democracy again in 1992. We have been under military regime for a long time, from, from 82, 31st December, mm. 1982, the 81 to be precise, to 1970, 1992. And then there was rumor that all the, the political ban would be lifted. So all the political groupies in Ghana started forming clubs, because we were not allowed to, to do politics. So we formed into, so we had the, Kwame Nkuma Welfare Club, Kwame Nkuma Welfare Society. And that also began meeting and discussing and planning how to form a political party when the ban was lifted. Hmm. There was some misunderstanding amongst us, amongst them. So the, the group was split into three different components. And Tommy Thompson was heading one of them, and he wanted us to be part of his group. So that's how my political career started. And members of the club included Mr. Freddie Blay, mm. who is now the chairman MPP, of the chairman. MPP, but he was an Nkrumah before, mm. but he changed. <laughs> uh, Nifuta, who is the chief of NIMA, was one of them. Tommy Thompson was one of them. Kwesia Blay was one of them. Kweku Bako was one of them. Media was one of them. Quite a number of them. They were the nucleus of the Heritage Club. Mm. And we went and joined. This is how I was introduced into politics. Into politics. And since then, I've, I've, I've been active in politics. And I, I was one time the publicity director of TPP. Mm. And I was one of those people who fought for them to reclaim the name and the symbol of CPP. It was myself, Dr. Indo, Freddie Blay was our lawyer. Uh, who else was there? Antifos and Nelson was there. We were all part of the Nkrumah group who went to court and to reclaim the name and the, and the symbol and the colors of CPP. But looking at your party today, do you think you can ever come to power? Is it possible? Well, in politics, you can never say never. Mm. It's possible they can come to power, but how long is it going to take to come there? But until the, the characters in the various groups change, it's going to be difficult. But uh, as I said, as a preamble, in politics, you can never say never. Everything is possible, mm. depending on the circumstances. So what kind of strategies are you adopting to you know, see your party in power? Well, I was part of the CPP, and we broke up to form the PPP. Ah, so you've left CPP? I've left CPP. To PPP? To PPP. Why PPP? Because... I share their philosophy and sentiments. CPP must change, but there are other members of CPP who think that it might be the same old CPP. 
but times change, people change, you must change with the times. So I have opted to change into the PPP. And what's your role with the PPP? Because of my tender age, I'm now the chairman of the advisory council of PPP. It's a long way to go, but there's a possibility that maybe one. It's interesting to note, mm. and it's on record, mm. that during, since CPP, PPP came into power, we have become the third strongest party in, in the country. Mm. Even though the numbers are small, we are still bigger of the smaller parties. There are two big parties in Ghana at the moment, NDC and, 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 and MPP. But the smaller parties, PNC, uh, GCPP, uh, NIP, they are all going to, we came third. Mm. So we are the strongest. So there's a possibility that one day we can come to power. But as, as I'm saying, you can never say never in mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. So we are in the election year 2020. How prepared is the PPP? towards uh, this election? Well, we are preparing, but depending on the, where you stand, you may not even notice it. This the coronavirus is, is in town and putting pressure on every, everybody. Nothing is moving. Mm -hmm. So you cannot even organize meetings. But we are gradually building up. And when the time comes, you will hear the voices mm -hmm. of PPP. Mm -hmm. uh, because you are a media personality, let's uh, do a quick uh, analysis or diagnosis of the media today. Are you happy with what you see and hear in terms of TV and radio in Ghana today? I would say I, am, I have mixed feelings. Happy sometimes and sad sometimes. Happy that there is now competitiveness in the media and is helping to, to bring out new talent. But some other areas too, we are falling. Like which areas? In terms of program content, I think sometimes the presenters don't do enough homework. So they are found short. And it's, it's, not, it's not becoming as innovative as I would like, in that everybody is doing the same thing. You switch on the radio, television in the morning, and everybody is doing morning show, morning show, newspaper review. review. And they are bringing only politicians to come and do a review. So the moment Ahmad begins to talk, and I know her political leanings, <laughs> I can foretell what, what she she's say. going to say. And I would have thought that the radio and TV stations should sometimes introduce of people who are experts in the subject to come give us an neutral. expert, not necessarily neutral, but expert advice. Okay. Maybe neutral is, is the word, but uh, advice and analysis that cuts across, that mm. they are discussing the issue, not the personalities and, and, the, and the philosophy. Mm. This is where I, fo I, 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 I fall back, that I think that we are not being innovative enough in the media. But the competition is good, it's healthy. And I also think that the owners of the ra various radio stations should invest in the personnel of the, of the, and the staff of the station so they can do a better job and equipment. These days, it's, it's, it's easier. When we first started television, if you went into the studio and started that half-hour program and made a mistake on the 29th minute, you must start all over again. Yeah. Now you can easily edit, edit. cut, and, and paste, join. and join, and then the program goes on. The mistakes you make can be covered. But in those days, I remember one time we were in the studio from about 7 p.m. to till 8 in the morning. Because we were making, having technical difficulties, having human difficulties, and all kinds of difficulties. That we start, and in the middle, there's a, there's a break or something, so we must start all. Editing was not known. Hmm. These days you can easily edit and even bring in a feature from somewhere and put it in and nobody will notice it. it's been edited. So Let, let's look at your, your GBC now. Are you happy with our output? GBC can do better. I think maybe some restrictions that you have, some, some, 
some difficulties that you have or you are not being properly financed because you are doing a community service at the same time doing commercial service. So you need more money to be able to expand and do more innovative things. Mm. I don't know what the difficulties are, but GBC, before it was just GBC, so competition was not there. Now there's, it's very competitive. Yeah. I don't know how much you are being paid to give you the incentive to want to work <laughs> extra hard. I don't know how much <laughs> the, the, the cameramen are being paid for them not yeah. to look behind their shoulder yeah. or waiting to hear somebody has a vacancy for another cameraman for they're going to go. So there's no proper coordination. And there are short, shortfalls and shortcomings in the system. And I think GBC is slow in catching up. Most of the stations have pulled, pulled your, your, your staff into their station with better attractive rewards. Packages. So that's where GBC is. But uh, Mr. Mike Egan, uh, do you regret time spent at GBC? Oh, no. If I got a chance, I'll do it again. Mm. GBC opened doors for me. I think I was lucky enough to have Leo Rabbi Williams as my boss. He gave me the platform and a carte blanche, an open check to operate. Not that it was so open that we couldn't do anything else, mm. but he, he is the one who gave us the freedom, David and myself, mm. to experiment and do innovative things. But every now and again, he will still call you and tell you that what this one you did, you didn't do it right. Go and do it this way. He will correct us. Yeah. But I don't know whether it's the same now. <laughs> well. <laughs> and then okay. for some time also, when I came back and joined the commercial station, Mr. John Hammond, one of the best news readers we've ever had, was my boss. We got them very well. But he is the one who is forever listening to the station that even if you use a word wrongly, wrongly, he will be either in the studio or he'll be on the phone to tell you that. And he never called me by my English name. Mm -hmm. He always called me Atu. Mm. Atu, I didn't like A, B, C, D. So go back and do A, F, K. He was forever listening. He has transistor radio in his washroom, in his living room, in his bedroom, so he's forever listening to what his boys are doing. Mm. So I don't regret my days in broadcasting. Even if it wasn't for broadcasting, I don't know where I would be today. Mm. Uh, but, but of course, I mean, I mean, it, you were big those days. I mean, huge personality. How did you handle the fame? Well, my guiding principles in life have been built around four facets, humility, respect, discipline, and modesty. And I always tell my friends that not many people know how to handle power and fame. It gets into your head and it could easily destroy you. But I have always respected and, I, and given credit to those who listen to me. Yesterday, for example, I went to visit a friend. In, in fact, it was, it was not my friend. It was my friend, my son's friend. We visited him, and he was telling me that he was driving, and he had some people on his car. And he heard my name that I was going to speak. And they asked him to stop <laughs> so that they could listen to what I was, I was going to say. And this is modesty. This is overwhelming that somebody wants to hear me speak. And even parked his car. Yes, parked his car. So to control fame, fortune, and popularity is not easy, but you must always think of where you are coming from and where, where you have come to. You know, how did you get there? Was it through the, the right way or was it through the help of other people? And I think I am what I am today because 
I, I made an impact on some people who liked me. And I don't think everybody in the world will like everybody. Much as I, I must have entertained and made a lot of people happy, there were others too who perhaps didn't like me. But they may be in minority. And maybe theirs will be out of envy or jealousy. But I think I humbled myself, and I still believe I, I'm humble and modest in my ways. I don't believe in ostentatious things. I like to live a life that is comfortable, that is within range, but never do anything that is lead me into any difficulty. Mm -hmm. So these are my principles, modesty, humility, respect, and discipline. But then growing up, did it ever occur to you that uh, someday you will become this big? Especially when you, you, you knew the entertainment industry was what you wanted. Did it ever cross your mind? That, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to use the word big. <laughs> Famous. Fame, yes. Famous, popular, well-known, yes. But to feel big is what will let you down. Because you, you think you are bigger as, as some people. Do you know who I am? Mm. <laughs> so I like, to, I like to see things from my perspective. That if I'm being recognized more than you, it's because I've done things that have pleased them. And if you did the same thing, it might even overshine me. I like to be modest, it's, even though it's not the, the easiest thing to do. But if you try hard enough, and if you believe in God, and pray for God's direction and influence in your life, you will be, for want of a better word, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mike Higgins, we'll take our, our second break, and when we come back, we'll conclude the conversation. Okay. Well, so the program is Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. We take another quick break. When we come back, we will talk more. Please stay there. Welcome back. You're still watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. On Legends of Our Time, we celebrate our heroes. My name is Getty J, and my guest for today is Mr. Mike Egan, and of course, we are coming to you from his home. So, Mr. Mike Egan, my hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tell me about your nuclear family, wife, kids, grandchildren, any. Well, um, I've been married to my wife for 56 years. How many years? 56. Whoa. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Or mm. if maybe more, I'm still maybe counting. more. <laughs> I'm still counting. Mm. And I have uh, four children, two okay. boys and two girls. Unfortunately, one died in oh. 1989. Mm. But the rest are alive and kicking. I have eight grandchildren, lovely grandchildren. One of them just came and disturbed <laughs> us. He says he's my bodyguard. <laughs> That's good. He usually <laughs> comes here mm. with a gun in his hand that he's come to see if somebody's troubling me. <laughs> <laughs> you are lucky. <laughs> yes. So this this is my, my family. So what has been the secrets uh, behind this over five decades uh, union? I wouldn't say that I've been a perfect husband. I've had my own shortcomings. 
so has my wife. But I think we had an understanding. We started dating whilst I was in secondary school. She died. She died. Was she also there? No, she wasn't there. But she was working at the uh, UTC, the domestic, is it cosmetics department? That's why I, I saw her and I liked her and we fell in love. And we Student to worker relationship. Yes. Wow. And we've had difficulties, but with God's guidance and believe that we can find solution to that problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have been solving them. Some were difficult, not easy to surmount. Others, we could easily ignore it. And one other thing that I have learned from my father is that both of you shouldn't be angry at the same time. You must give way to the other person, even if you think you are right. Mm -hmm. Let your wife think she's right. And let time pass. And then bring the subject up when both of you are sober and discuss it. I also believe that when two people have an argument, a debate, a fight, and when they retire and they break away, in their own sober moments, they will agree that this part, I am right. This part, I am wrong. So with this sort of analysis, you can always find a way to address the difficulties that you were facing. So that has been my secret. secret. Allowing the other side to win for a day and then you discuss it. And then there's some understanding. I also have a record that I admire so much by Ray Charles, and it's called Understanding is the Best Thing in the World. And it says that man and wife would fight, but if there's understanding, there's always going to be peace. I also remember that I was a chairman for a wedding of one of my nieces, and an old lady was asked to come and cut the cake. And she said that before she helps them to cut the cake, she would like to explain why married couples cut cake. Cut is spelled C U T. C is for communication. If there's some misunderstanding in the house and you communicate, you tell your husband tells you gifty, why did you do this? And you explain. And he also tells you why he's not happy about that situation. The communication will create understanding. Right. Once you understand the cause of the miscommunication, there will be trust. And with trust, all things are okay. That's interesting. And so, have uh, any of your children following your career path? No. No. Unfortunately, no. no. What but are maybe fortunately, One is into business, the other one is into IT. Okay. And the third one? Michelle, she just had a baby. Beautiful daughter. <laughs> She has. She's, uh, she's two years. She's called Ashley. Mm. So Michelle has got it. So she is still at home. Okay. She used to work with Talof, mm. but she's now at home with taking care of the, of the daughter. Okay. Uh, let's look quickly look at your um, autobiography. Uh, what's the title? Well, this book, I don't know if you have time, <laughs> but it, it came to, to be born because mm. a friend of mine, Professor Adai, not the, the Gimpa Adai. The this is the he's, a, he's also called Professor Adai. Mm. He is a historian. He's, he's a medical doctor and a historian as well. He wrote 10 books on Ghana's uh, medicine, hospitals, military, navy, and all that. And was launching. And he called me. <laughs> so I went and did the MC for him. And then at the end of it, he came to thank me. Don't well, thank me because you've given me a platform to be part of a successful launch. He said, but you should write your own story. And I said, me, my story? <laughs> yes, say yes, your story would be interesting. But he never stopped asking me to, to write the book. And then my good friend, Mr. Lydon Islander, also was always telling me that Every time now and again when we traveled campaigning, I will regale him with some of my stories, my experiences. And he say, why don't you write a book? So these two people influenced me to write the book. And I was also thinking of me being a Ghanaian and writing from, the, from Ghana. And the, Ghana, the equator and the meridian are, are meeting in Ghana, where Tema is. 
So I was writing my, my story from the center of the world and as a broadcaster. And this book was launched on the 27th of August, 2019. So usually, I should have given you a copy of the book to read. I'll take a copy. Here's, here's your copy. <laughs> Thank you. I'll photograph it for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, look at uh, recognition awards as a result of, I mean, your career, what you did, your achievement. Well, I think my reward has come by the, the stage of, of my life, that despite difficulties in life, it, life has its own hurdles, yeah, he yeah. and I've been able to overcome most of the hurdles, and now at my, the twilight of my life, I'm enjoying a peaceful rest. Um, I've won a couple of awards that gives me that gives me a lot of gratification. Okay. In 1979, the military regime of uh, a champion gave me grand medal. Maybe I should have brought it for you to take a sh look at it. President Kufu also gave me an award when he was exiting from his reign as a president, he gave me order of the Volta. Yeah. So I've won two awards. National of the high, awards. Yeah, national awards. Mm -hmm. uh, what other awards have I won? I was given an award in the hospitality industry too. I went to France to receive that award. I was given an award for my company, or our company, I should say, have interest in Providence Insurance Company. They were uh, given an award in the insurance industry. And uh, a few others that I don't remember. Some of them are so small that <laughs> not easy to remember. So you are a fulfilled person? Very fulfilled. And I give thanks and credit to God Almighty. No regrets? Regrets, yes. I have regrets. Regret that as we are talking now, I wish I had educated myself higher than I did. It's not for want of money, but I was enjoying my profession as a broadcaster that I didn't think that with better education, I could even be better as a broadcaster. That's one of my biggest regrets. Now you can still go back to school. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am I'm as young as 84 years. So you can still go back to school. Yes, I, I can. You can. But I can't keep Keep vigil. <laughs> I easily fall asleep these days. <laughs>
is what a friend we have in Jesus. Why that particular song? My father introduced me to it, and I also believe that Jesus is the greatest friend that anybody can have. Sister Mike Egan, I wish to you know, shake your hand, but I can't do that because of COVID-19. Maybe she works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for time spent with you. Indeed, we are so grateful. Thank you very and, uh, much for coming. You are coming a true me. hero. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. May the good Lord continue to preserve you. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Gifty. <laughs> Well, so the program has been Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. My guest for today has been Mr. Mike Egan, the ace broadcaster. My name is Gifty AJ. Thank you so much for watching. We'll come your way same time, God willing, next week. Until then, enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye. At least five people have been killed and 19 others seriously 